I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, the president of Spiritual Awakenings International. Welcome to our Spiritual Awakenings International Presents event. We're happy to see you here. Spiritual Awakenings International is truly an international network. We have subscribers in 78 countries right now, which is absolutely awesome. So just take a moment now and please type into the chat where you're joining us from today. We always love to know where people are joining us from. I am joining you from Toronto, Canada today, and our speaker, Erica McKenzie, is joining us from Houston, Texas, and there I see Columbia, Whitehorse in the Yukon, Chicago, BC, Canada, Portland, Oregon, Utah, awesome, awesome. Welcome everyone from all over the world. So um, I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Brian Sackett, who is a Spiritual Awakenings International board member, who is going to introduce our speaker for today, and then he will also be hosting our question and answer period. Brian. Uh, thanks, Yvonne. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Erica McKenzie. Erica is a registered nurse, and she's the author of a book called Dying to Fit In, and she'll be speaking to it with us about that today. She's also the author of uh, four chapters in a different spiritual book. And one of Erica's gifts is that uh, she supports people in connecting to spirit and then expressing that uh, in our daily lives. And she helped me that way when I met her nine years ago and encouraged me to start speaking about my spiritually transformative experiences. So please uh, join me in warmly welcoming Erica McKenzie. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay. And I just, first of all, want to start out by saying I'm just so grateful to be here, and I'm very thankful to have this experience to uh, share my near-death experience with you. And in some way, I hope I can connect and touch each one of you. Um, since we only have an hour, there's so much that's happened to me in my life that led up to the day that I died and then going on to heaven and having this incredible experience that I'm not gonna be able to cover everything in this talk, but what's really important is I feel led to share at least a little bit to paint a picture of what happened um, before I died. And so <clears throat> I'd like to start with telling you all that I was blessed as a child to learn about uh, my creator. And at that time I knew their names were Jesus and God. And so the home I was raised in, Jesus and God were like family members. And so it was, you know, a very familiar thing. And when I was little, I grew up having these family members be a very big part of my life. And so much so that I felt like I had established at such an early age, this connection that I would hear God's voice with me all the time, like a playmate. And it was pretty amazing. And I came to really enjoy this relationship that I had and really relied on it at an early age to learn a lot of things about the world and about people and animals. And looking back now, all of those things that I was learning in this relationship that I had, they were all wonderful, good things that love was involved. And it made me feel so good about myself as a person having that love relationship because it allowed me to see my peers um, with love. And so I tended to see all the good things, I guess. Those are the things that I was always pointing out was, wow, Shane Martin in my class, he's so smart. He's amazing. Look at his brain. I, you know, I didn't have that gift of smart. So I just was always able to pick out the really amazing things in people. And I loved it. I was so happy. And then what happened was junior high. <laughs> and um, it was almost like overnight that everything, this world that I had built and lived in and loved being in had come tumbling down and it changed. And my peers, um, you know, so many of them no longer were this loving, bubbly, embracing uh you know, let's do everything together. Everybody's having fun type of people. It was really 
Um, I'm better than you. You know, you're ugly, you're fat, you're not smart, you're stupid, you know, those kind of things. And um, it started happening that I was being bullied and being told those things about myself. But I also was witnessing other people having these things happen to them. And it really, really struck the wrong chord with me. I couldn't let it go. It really, really bothered me because I knew for such a long time that that's not the way that God had designed it to be. And so what I ended up doing out of, you know, frustration was I tried really hard to make things better by telling people, you know, no, 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 we can't be like that. We have to, you know, we have to involve everybody and, you know, no, that person isn't that look, they're smart or they're, you know, trying to help people see the good things because there was good in everyone. And it was so frustrating because it was like met on deaf ears. And as I'm watching all this unfold in my life, it's like I had the realization that, wow, so mankind is kind of saying a lot of opposite things of what God's, you know, sharing and telling me in my life. So it was hard to, the more I would listen to what mankind was saying, you know, you got to be skinny to um, be accepted or you have to dress like this, or you have to be mean to that person. Like the more I started listening to those things, the mankind voice, the more I started drowning out God's voice. And I didn't have the wherewithal or the maturity then, like I do now looking back, to really understand and appreciate this pattern that I started developing, stifling God's voice as I was trying to be accepted. I was trying to fit in. I was trying to belong, stifling it more listening to mankind's voice, what was important to mankind. And that's really important because it sets the table for what happened to me in my near-death experience and what I learned. And so going along this pattern, ha having such a strong frustration that I couldn't change things with my voice, it wasn't enough. I started taking things out on myself and what ended up happening when I was 12 years old, I was in seventh grade, is I became bulimic. And um, I ended up having that habit for nearly 12 years. And it's looking back now and having the, the wisdom and the knowledge to know it was uh, my way of coping with something that I knew was wrong in the world and it was affecting me, but I couldn't control that. Um, and so, that's important to know because lasting 12 years, you know, that took me through uh, college and out of college when I was done, graduating from nursing school and getting my first job as a nurse for a group of doctors, I was introduced to, at the time, um, some diet pills that were approved at the time, a class four narcotic, um, but had to be under the supervision if you took them for uh, weight loss. Now, you have to understand all these years looking back, if you would look at pictures of me, you probably would have said, my God, she was never even overweight. I don't even understand why she was doing that. But it just goes to show you that the poisoning of the mind of years of drowning out the voice of God and listening to mankind and just playing into all of that, I lost myself and who I was. I didn't even see it anymore. So, you know, finding out about these diet pills and having this opportunity is what I thought to take them was relief because it made it so I didn't have to be bulimic anymore because I was, you know, starting to get a lot of health issues from having bulimia for that long. But what I didn't realize at the time is what I was only doing was turning it into um, a bigger set of problems that would eventually kill me. So I took those diet pills and they were supposed to be taken for only a handful of months at the most a year or two under doctor supervision. And I ended up finding a doctor ultimately that prescribed them to me for nine years. Um, now, the biggest side effects of these diet pills was you didn't eat and you didn't sleep. So try doing that for nearly nine years. <laughs> and you know, having the nursing knowledge, um, realizing, wow, your neurons are really misfiring at that point, just with a few days of not eating or sleeping. Can you imagine doing this consistently for almost nine years of your life? And, 
you know, there were people come to find out now that died from being on those uh, diet pills. And at one point the FDA did take them off the market because they hurt so many people and they were abused. But the problem with them being a class four narcotic is they were so addictive. And I had never up until taking those pills, taken any kind of, you know, drugs or anything other than having alcohol once in a while. And so not understanding what it was like to be addicted to something like that, um, you know, set me in this whole mindset of, I really believed that I needed those pills to survive. And, you know, as I got closer to almost nine years of my life, my health had taken such a toll. Um, my body really started doing things that were not normal. And I knew it wasn't normal. And I, I knew it also was because of the diet pills. And so what happened was I, I found myself bargaining with God being like, God, I, I know that this is bad for me. I know I shouldn't be doing this and I need to get off of these. And I know this is wrong. And, um, but I was just trying to buy more time and I just didn't think I could do it. And I was embarrassed. I hid this from my family, my husband, my friends, no one knew. Um, and at the same time, it was like, I would try to lay down to go to sleep at night. And when I would be laying down, all of a sudden I could feel my lungs it was like my brain wasn't remembering how to tell my lungs to open and close to breathe something that none of us even think about, right? We breathe. It's so natural. We, we go through our whole day. We don't even think about it. We'll try, try being in a situation where it's like, okay, all of a sudden now this isn't working. My lungs aren't working. I cannot breathe. And I would have to jump out of bed and be, start jumping up and down. And it felt like that was what was waking my body up and getting my circulation going so I could breathe. And it would scare my husband. He'd be like, you know, oh my gosh, what's wrong? Is there an intruder or whatever? I mean, talk about going through this for so long, the poor man, because I lied about it all the time. You know, I never told him why this was happening. And so he was so worried about me thinking, oh gosh, you know, you're a, you're a young mother and you're working hard. And, you know, he didn't know what was wrong, what was causing these behaviors. But um, obviously to other people looking, you know, in at me, they're like, something is going on. And so the feeling like I wasn't going to be able to breathe anymore, my lungs weren't working, it started to be such a daily event that it wasn't now just when I was laying down to try to rest, but it would be when I was just trying to make dinner. And all of a sudden it would be like, I felt like I was going to pass out. I felt like my heart was trying to be, and it couldn't. And it was almost like the message center, the operation center, my brain wasn't firing correctly and telling these organs what their jobs were. And so it got to the point, finally, that last day that I died, that's exactly what happened. I remember feeling like, oh my gosh, I can't breathe and I needed to take a breath. And I remember jumping out of the chair, but this time I wasn't lucky like all the other times we're just getting, you know, jumping around, moving around, the circulation was getting me back into my body. This time I died. So I took my last breath. And in that moment, I remember having this panic feeling of, I did not know who I was. I didn't know my name, Erica. I had lost all knowing of this human being. And when I let go in that moment, you would think, that it would be so incredibly painful. And going back to the organized religion, you know, growing up in that, I appreciate a lot of the tools that I learned, but one of the things I didn't appreciate was I had this huge fear of dying. I was terrified of dying because I knew that I was a sinner and I was taught, you know, you, when you sin and you die, you get judged by God. And I knew I had messed up so much that I was definitely going to be going to hell. I mean, there was just no way. I, I wouldn't even know how. Yes, Jesus died for my sins. I was taught, but I still felt like I was such a bad person. I'd done so many things wrong. And so dying was such a terrifying thing to me. And so when I had that last breath, my body separated. And so I am now all of a sudden like on the ceiling. And I'm looking down at myself, which I call the shell, the actual body, the physical frame. And I remember looking at it and thinking, wow, that's me. And feeling like, oh my gosh, and taking this huge breath. 
for the first time really breathing and I was finally alive for the first time. And this was really me. And even though I remember just looking at myself on the floor and being so grateful for the things that I had experienced while I was here on this earth as a human, I understood in that moment that, man, I'm really alive. Finally, I was so confined to that thing, that shell. This is really me. And you know, having this incredible feeling, it was like, wow, there's no pain. There is absolutely no pain. This is the most exhilarating, wonderful feeling you can even imagine. And as I'm feeling this feeling and looking at myself and I'm watching now the paramedics coming in and they're starting to work on my body. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, you know, there are some really amazing people after all. They really do love and care. Like they didn't know me and here they were doing everything they could to try to help me. And I just remember feeling so grateful for that. I'm watching that unfold. And then at the same moment, I feel this presence by me and it's this angel and I can't look upon it. It's too brilliant of a feeling, not only with your senses that we know as humans, sight, you know, feeling, touch, sound, but it was also greater than that. It was almost like this connection of always knowing this angel was so profound and amazing. And the angel had told me lovingly, it's time. And so I just remember letting go one more time and then just effortlessly for just a very brief time of darkness, but it wasn't scary at all, being put into a huge tunnel. And this tunnel was the most amazing, amazing tunnel because it was alive. It was luminous. It had colors that I can't even describe because there are no human words. And that's the most challenging thing I feel like through this whole near-death experience for me coming back and trying to share with people is I don't have a lot of words that give it uh, justice for the magnitude of the things that I experienced, but I'm trying my best and just know that I let go and I felt more love in this tunnel that was alive. And that love was the energy that perpetuated me up. And I was going up. And and when I had the realization, wow, we're going up. This is amazing. I can't believe this love. I've never felt this magnitude of love on earth. Then it started propelling me even faster. And we got to this rate. It was like a supersonic rate of speed, but it was exhilarating. It was the most incredible, wonderful feeling. I can't even describe to you, all I can tell you is that if I never left this tunnel, and that is all that happened to me in my NDE, I would have been more, more than enough. It would have been more than enough because it felt so familiar. And at the same time, I had never received so much familiar love to that magnitude. I don't know how much time I spent in that tunnel going up. It seemed like a long time, but that's another thing that I try to explain to people that time is so different there. It doesn't exist like we know it as humans here. Um, And so having that realization, I'm not sure how long I was in the tunnel, but I just remember at one point seeing almost a clearing ahead of me. And as soon as I've seen this clearing open space, we get to the end. And I remember the angel leaving me and I'm standing there and I am in space with all of the most incredible stars all around. And I can see very far distant. There's like planets and galaxies and it's so profound. And as soon as I have this feeling like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. I'm in space. It's so profound. I get this feeling to my right, and it's God. And God was so profound that I could not, I could not look upon him. But I didn't have to. And again, this is where it's so important to understand that the five senses that we know it here and we have access to as humans, there are senses I don't have words for, but I had access to. And it was like my senses were on steroids, if you will. And I felt God just giving me this huge hug. And as soon as I got this hug, I knew exactly where I was. There was no doubt in my mind that I was home. I was home. Finally, that was home. 
And as soon as I had this love feeling back to God, we began to communicate in a way, which I've come to learn now is called telepathically, where I would think a thought. And as soon as I would have that thought, God was replacing that thought with an answer or a lesson. And I knew God said to look out in front of me. And so I looked out in front of me at all these incredible stars, and it was just so profound. And all of a sudden, I'm watching, and the stars are doing something. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I think they're lining up. And as soon as I had the realization these stars are lining up, they're making like this huge curtain. And I hear this whirring sound in my left ear. It sounded like what I had grown up with. I grew up in a small farm town and it, they had like a vintage projector at the movie theater. And I could hear this whirring sound of the movie theater projector in my left ear and I'm watching the stars and all of a sudden they started to part and there was a movie screen, a huge movie screen. And it said the life review of Erica McKenzie. And then a movie started. And the first thing I remember seeing was my mom in the hospital and she had just given birth to me and she was holding me. And it was the most incredible feeling. And it started with that moment of my birth. And then I proceeded to stand with God and we watched this whole movie of me, all the events in my life till the day that I died. I was 31 years old when I died. Now, the things that I saw the very first thing I saw, I can tell you after seeing that moment of my mom and I in the hospital was I was in school and I was in first grade and I was losing my first tooth. And one of my friends in my class was helping me pull my tooth out. And I was so proud of myself. And then there was things like in third grade, I'd had won a spelling bee. Um, and then there was things like going to junior high and I played in the band and I learned how to play several instruments and, you know, did a really good job with those things. And then I started playing sports and I excelled in sports and cheerleading and plays and newspaper, you know, reporters and articles and uh, yearbook. And then it was, I graduated from high school and then it was, wow, I went to college. I graduated from college, you know, then I got married. And then I became a mother and I had children. It was all these amazing things. And it was like, as I'm seeing them unfold on the screen, I'm also reliving those moments. So again, people ask me a lot, you know, well, okay, so you died when you were 31 years old. Is that 31 human years? All I can tell you is remember time does not exist there. So I, you know, didn't have 31 human years there as I knew it, but yet I was still reliving each day that I saw these events. And what was incredible was I'm going through my life and watching these events on the screen, and I'm getting closer to that day that I died. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, I started kind of having a panic human moment, meaning I'm getting closer to the day I died. Why have I not seen one negative thing? I mean, I'm a sinner. I've messed up so much. I was taught, you know, when I die, God would judge me. Okay. So I'm like, okay, it's coming. It's coming. And I started instead of um, keep receiving all this incredible love by seeing all these wonderful things, I started shutting that off. And I started focusing on, oh my God, oh my God, it's coming. I, I'm so bad. He's probably going to strike me with lightning. I mean, all these things are going through my head. I'm going to hell. I'm not going to get to stay. And sure enough, we get to the day that I died. And do you know what? God did not judge me. God loved me. In fact, he loved me more than and all this love that I told you guys that I've never been able to feel until I died, he loved me more. There was so much love being poured into me from him. At one point, I honestly thought, I, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't receive more. I'm going to burst. Like it was, it was so incredible. And it was so opposite of what I was taught that I thought, I, I, I never want to be parted from you again. I, I'm so grateful for this, that you love me. So I thought we were done. I thought, okay, we're going into heaven. You know, this is amazing. And then all of a sudden, I see in front of me a pier 
a pair of eyeglasses. Okay. Now I never wore glasses. I had perfect vision at this point. And these glasses weren't your normal pair of glasses that we would all wear. They were the size of a small vehicle and they were right in front of me. And God told me to put those glasses on. And I said to God, um, that's impossible. They're so big. I, there's no way. As soon as I'm having that human thought, I feel my hands reluctantly. They just are going for the glasses and I feel myself and I'm pulling them onto my face, got them on my face. And do you know what? They fit me perfectly. And then God said to me, now look. And as soon as he said that to me, I remember having to look out in front of me again. I saw the stars lining up just like they had the first time. And I heard that whirring sound of the projector in my left ear, three, two, one, the, cur the curtain opens. And it says again, the life review of Erica McKenzie, the same first picture on the screen, my mom holding me in the hospital after she had just had me. This time, everything else after that was completely different. This time, the first thing I remember seeing was, I think I was like five years old and we were at the rest home and we were singing Christmas carols with my brownie troop and I went missing. And finally they found me, the leaders found me and I was in this room of one of the uh, residents and I was sitting on this elderly woman's lap and I was brushing her hair and I was singing, Jesus loves me to her. And then I saw things after that, like saving an animal, you know, that needed to be rescued. Then I saw things like sticking up for my friends when, you know, people were trying to be mean to them and nobody was being nice and, and making them feel like, you know, horrible about themselves. I remember looking at this woman and carrying her groceries for her and helping her to her home and helping her put them away because she couldn't do it. So many events that I honestly did not remember ever being a part of. But there was a theme that I started to notice during this life review. This time, this theme was love was in every single thing. In fact, Love was the driving force of why all these events took place. And I'm getting to, again, the events of the day I died, 31 years. And I remember thinking, wow, okay, wait a minute. I now had two life reviews. And this one I have glasses on. And I can see. And God told me they were his glasses. And I needed them because he wanted me to see what was important to God. You see, the first life review was the things that were important to mankind, the things we garner as accomplishments, as milestones, we work towards them. It's not that they're not good things, but a lot of times humans put so much focus on those things, you know, that they miss what really is important. In fact, the only thing that's important to God. And that is love. Love is the answer. And so I am now understanding this and understanding why it was important for me to see this second life review, but I'm also having this human side of me left being like, okay, um, oh my gosh, I'm almost to the point where I'm dying. And wait a minute, I'm a sinner. And, oh my gosh, I must be so bad that I had to have two life reviews and it's really coming for me now. The judgment is coming for me. It's going to be this bad. This is how much I've messed up. I mean, who gets two life reviews, right? And so sure enough, I get to that day that I died in the second life review with God's glasses on. And do you know what? I did not get judged. How is it possible when on earth I had made so many decisions and lived my life for so many years because it was based on being judged by humans. People that thought that they were qualified to judge others. And I learned in that moment, when there's judgment, there is not love. 
you cannot have both. And I came to understand, wow, okay, wait a minute. If God, our creator, did not judge me, then who am I? Who am I that I even think for one moment that I have the qualification to judge others? I came to understand how imperative it is that we do not do that because it, it creates a roadblock. It separates us from the love that is designed on a big level. And there's a lot of reasons why, and you're going to find out why love is so important. And so we get to the end of this, and I'm, I'm just so overwhelmed with how much love God is continuing to pour into me. And I'm thinking, I, I can't even believe that I'm so deserving. Like he's spending all this time with me as well to drive home these points, to teach me. This is important to him that I know this. And I was very grateful for that. And just feeling like, again, if this is all that happened, I would be more, it was more than enough. And I was ready to go into heaven. I was ready to, you know, I knew I wasn't going back to earth. There was no way I was home. And I was so grateful for the lesson. And, and then God told me we weren't done with the lessons. There wasn't going to be going into heaven yet or anything. There was more, more that I needed to learn. And so, you know, it was a thing where I just, I can't even explain again, how it's important for us to understand God taking this time with me is not just about me. It was about each and every one of us, him having this, this much love for each and every one of us. And so the next lesson we had was called the, the rippling effect. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got to take a drink. Sorry, guys. I've been talking a lot. <clears throat> okay. So the rippling effect, God told me to look up and to my right. And this is the only moment of my whole near-death experience that I was allowed to see any part of God in a physical vision way. And I remember looking in front of me and all of a sudden appeared this arm. And it was from the fingertip all the way to the shoulder. And it was the size of a semi-truck. And I remember looking at it and just, I could see like hairs, like human hairs. It was just, the definition was incredible. It was so powerful. And it was God's arm. And I remember looking at the tip of his fingers and they were up so high that I could almost not see it anymore into the stars. And all of a sudden on God's palm appeared this huge rock, a boulder. And it was bigger than any boulder I'd ever even seen on earth. It was the size of a small vehicle and it was just sitting in his palm. And I remember looking at it and thinking, wow, that's absolutely incredible. And God said, you're the rock. And I'm looking going, oh, geez, okay. And <laughs> that's amazing. And then all of a sudden, light that was so blinding, kind of like behind Robert's picture there that is so profound, just from everywhere, emanated from everywhere, from this rock. And God said, you are the light. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, okay, I'm the rock, I'm the light. And then God said, the light is of me and I am with you. And as soon as he said that, he let loose the rock and we watched it together fall for what seemed like such an incredibly long period of time. And as it gets closer to going down right in front of me, this rock that I'm thinking, okay, I, I need to remember this. God said, I'm the rock, I'm the light, the light is of God and God is with me. All of a sudden appeared the largest body of water, bigger than the biggest ocean with no borders was right in front of us. And we watched this rock and it plunged into this ocean. It made such a huge impact. And yet it only created one single ripple. And we watched this ripple of water as it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew past the borders. I couldn't even see that ripple anymore. And God explained to me that that water is mankind. And I was the ripple. And like that ripple affected that water, so too do my words, thoughts, and actions affect all of mankind. I tried to wrap my head around that because I'm thinking that, how is that possible? But again, 
I learned that word. All things are possible with our creator. So here's the point. That light is a gift that God gives us when we come to earth. Okay? But free will, it's up to us on if we want to choose to let that light shine or hide that light. But guess what we don't have a choice on? We are going to impact each other while we're here, just like that rock did the water and it created that ripple. We don't have a choice. So our thoughts, words, and actions are going to affect so many while we're here. Do you want to do it with your light on or off? And do you know what that light was? What powered that light? The force of love, the love force. That is the most powerful thing, love. So the more love we have and we choose, we shine, the greater that positive, empowering impact can be while we're here. So I thought, oh my gosh, I'm trying to like take notes and I don't have paper, but I'm putting it in my head as best as I can because I thought, oh, you know, this is, this is so profound. I mean, it makes so much sense. How can we not all just know this? Why aren't we all just doing this on earth? I'm thinking, oh my gosh, my life would have been so much different. Like why? This is, it makes so much sense. And with God, it just seemed, being there just seems so logical, so easy, so natural. And then I had another lesson. God's like, yeah, well, we're not done learning yet. Let's focus over here. And I knew I had to look again to my right. And this time what appeared in front of me was shelves bookshelves. These weren't your normal bookshelves. I don't even know what the color is. Honestly, I'm doing my best to describe it, but it was white, but like layers of luminescence through the white, almost like a 3D, but the shelves were alive. They had a life force. And I remember looking all the way up as far as I could past the stars and the shelves kept on going. I remember looking out in front of me and the shelves kept on going past the farthest planet and galaxies that I could see. And I remember looking behind me and the shelves kept on going as far as I could see that direction. Infinite amount of shelves. And all of a sudden, what appeared on all these shelves were gifts, presents, like at Christmas time. And you'd look under the tree and not, you know, not one gift is usually the same wrapped. They're different sizes, you know, different packaging, all of that. Well, all of these presents on all of these shelves, there was not one single space available. They filled the entire area and not one. I remember consciously taking the time to look and try to find one that remotely looked the same as the other. And I couldn't at all. And they felt so alive. And God said to me, when each and every one of you are born, I give all of you gifts. And he said, Erica, when you were born, I gave you the gift of patience and I gave you the gift of beauty. And I remember cutting off God in that moment. It's like, who does that? Who argues with God? But I proceeded to try to argue my case. Oh, no, 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 God, that can't be correct. You didn't give me the gift of beauty. Look, look what I did. Look, see, I wasn't good enough. Everybody's, you know, why? If I was, I wouldn't have been judged for that. And so it couldn't be correct. And he cut me off. And he firmly said this time, Erica, when you were born, I gave you the gift of patience. And I gave you the gift of beauty. And in that very moment, what I understood for the first time in my life that he meant is the gift of beauty came from within my heart. It was the love. And that gift extended to the exterior, the outer being. That's what it really meant. And what God said to me then was, do you know that I have more gifts? And he's showing me all on the shelves for each and every one of you throughout your life. And do you know how to get them? And I didn't know. And he said, all you have to do is ask. But then you must be quiet and listen to receive the gifts. And I knew being quiet and listening was, I was a pretty good talker. 
in my life, but I wasn't really good at being quiet and listening. Not like God was telling me. I had missed so many things in my life, wonderful things that God wanted to share with me and give to me. And when I was busy stifling God's voice because I was putting mankind's you know, judgments and thoughts and what was important, when I was putting those above God, I was actually stifling and creating a roadblock so that I could not receive the wonderful gifts that God had for me. And God explained to me that the reason why this is so important for all of us to use our gifts that we've been given throughout our journey, but not only that, to receive more gifts that God wants for each of us is we take those gifts and that is how we take mind, body, and spirit and we heal our lives. We help others heal. We empower ourselves. We empower others and embrace others. This is how we accomplish great things, wonderful, great things. This is the power. And we all have it when we come in, when we're born with this gift called life. But again, it's free will. And I had those things, but again, I did the roadblock like so many of us do because we don't feel like we're good enough. We measure up or we're horrible people, or we did this, that, or that person, you know, we're focusing on their um, inadequacies. And it takes, when you do that, you focus on those things and you're judging others, that takes the diminishing uh, beautifulness out of your gifts and you can't see them and use them. And I came to understood, this was our blueprint. You know how we each have a fingerprint and none of us, I mean, this is scientifically proven. None of us have the same fingerprint. We don't, right? I, I've never heard that two people have the same. This is how special, not just Erica McKenzie is, but each and every single person. And I'm going to tell you right now, I learned that if you are here and alive on this planet, you are breathing air, you matter, and you are just as valuable, if not more, than everybody else. It is so important because when you can see that and you can love not only others, but you have to learn to love yourself first. And that is something that as a child, I had done so well, but that turning point in my life, I diminished that love for myself. And remember, I told you the day that I died, I couldn't remember my name. I couldn't remember who I was. I had lost myself. It's so important that we give ourselves permission to see our greatness, our valuableness, our gifts, and love ourselves for who we are. Because God showed me he loves us for us. It's not for all those other things. The love connection is imperative so that we can fulfill our great journeys. They're so important. And it's not just about one person or a group of people. It's about all of us coming together. Because when we can have our light shine and we love ourselves, we have that love force for ourselves and for others, and we can help each other then together, that's when we're going to change things. And I saw it happen to the planet. It was such a profound lesson that I had this part of the human side of me so excited being like, oh my gosh, if I would have, again, only known all of this, it's so easy, God, when you're with me and showing me, it makes so much sense. The answer is right there. You know, I could do this. And Gosh, if I only knew this, then I could, I would tell so many people because then it would be easy for them. They could do this and we could do this great thing. And so I had that feeling. Then at the same time, I had this feeling of, I am home now. And thank you so much. I'm so grateful for you giving me all of these lessons, but I'm staying. 
So I don't need to take those things anywhere. I'm just going to go right behind me because I know heaven is behind me. It's right there. I'm just waiting. And God has a sense of humor. He smiled and he was like, um, well, actually, no, you have another lesson to learn. You're not going anywhere. And this time, this is called the earth and flames. And God and I are standing together. And this is the first time that I was directed to look down in front of me, but down. And as I'm looking down out in the universe in front of me, appeared the earth. And the earth seemed like in that moment that where I was was so vast that the earth just seemed like a, you know, a speck of dust, so small. And boy, all of a sudden in front of me appear what? Those eyeglasses of God's again. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to see, you know? And I didn't have a choice. I knew by now they're going to be put on. So I put them on and I'm looking. And this time I can really, really like earth is just like I could touch it. You know, it was just right there. It was, it was so incredible. It was so alive. It was so amazing. And I instantly was flooded with all of these amazing, beautiful memories of, you know, my time on earth and being with you know, animals and friends and family and having children. And I remember thinking in that moment, oh, my children and realizing, okay, I gave up a career to stay home to raise my children. Because to me at that point in my life, that was the most important thing to me was to be there for my children. So knowing that what kind of mom would have this next thought, which was, oh, my children are still there. And I'm very aware that I am, you know, here in heaven with God. And I'm not going back, but it's okay. They're going to be okay because you know what? We're always together. And in fact, there is this bridge that really exists between heaven and earth. And I saw it and I had absolutely no desire to go back in human form and be with my children because I knew that I was exactly where I was supposed to be. I was finally home. And I never wanted to be parted from God in that feeling again. And I knew that they would be with me again someday in the form that now I was. And so I had so much peace in knowing that. And I'm looking and I'm having this great feeling in this moment of reflection. And all of a sudden, for the first time through this whole experience, I feel this overwhelming sadness. It was so profound. And I was, I was like, wait, where's this coming from? Where is this? This, is, this isn't right. This doesn't feel right. And then I had the understanding it was coming from God and God was really sad. And I didn't understand that after everything that he had taught me and everything I've been experiencing, why would God be sad? And I remember God telling me <clears throat> that with the gift of life that he gives each and every one of us hand in hand is the gift of free will. And so God really tried to help me understand what that meant what that meant to God. God loves each and every one of us so much that free will is a choice that he's giving us. It's a gift to make, to have a love connection with the one that created us. So God does not force that connection. We get to choose that. So why is God sad? So God told me to look. So I looked down at the planet and this time I'm being able to really zone in and, you know, see very specific things. And what I'm seeing is like little flecks of orangey, reddish yellow all over the planet. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, as I'm focusing on these flecks, they start to grow and grow. And pretty soon I realize, oh my God, this is fire. And the earth is, is engulfed in flames. Every part of the earth was surrounded. And I start having this panic moment and I'm feeling more sadness from God. And I'm looking even past the flames now. And I'm terrified because remember, I have God's glasses on. So I could see what I wouldn't normally be able to see. And as I'm focusing in between all of the flames all over the planet, I see these sil silvery, white, luminescent with gold spun through it lights. They were like flecks. And they start lifting off. And as I'm trying to focus on what it is, I noticed, oh my God, those are souls. Those are humans. 
They're human souls and they are lifting off the earth unscathed from the flames. And now they're coming towards us and we're watching them and they're going past my left and they're going behind me into heaven. And I could feel all of the love and there was, there was thousands and thousands and thousands of them. <clears throat> and we watched this all happening. And I tell God, I mean, I'm so relieved at this point because everybody's okay that I'm seeing. And I tell God, oh, no, no, God, don't be sad. Don't cry. It's okay. Look, look, like I'm telling him to look. <laughs> and I have his glasses on. I'm like, look, it's okay. They're saved. Everybody's okay. And he said to me, Erica, with the gift of life, hand in hand, I give free will. And so he told me to look again. And so I'm looking again, and now I'm terrified. And I'm looking between all of the flames, and I see the souls that aren't lifting off. And I learned that what was propelling those souls that were lifting off and coming into heaven was the love connection that they chose free will to have with their creator. That was the fuel that they needed that sustained them. That was it. It was as simple as that. And so instead of God in that moment having this tremendous amount of joy, remember I told you each and every one of us are so important. He was crying for the ones that chose not to have that connection because the free will was a gift, so he couldn't force it. But he didn't give up. He loved all of them, and it hurt. And, you know, I'm a mom, and I am blessed that I have not lost a child. But all I can try to describe to you to get you to understand how important each of one, every one of us are, the magnitude that I felt of losing a child times thousands and thousands was the magnitude of sorrow in this huge hole in his heart that he felt he wasn't giving up, but he had this loss because he couldn't force this love connection. And after that, I didn't think I could handle much more because it, it, everything was just really profound. And that really hit home for me. I just could not let go of the earth and flames and the whole lesson and, and how it just made so much sense and how we were just all so lucky to have this gift. And it was just really overwhelming. And um, so I, I knew that, okay, I probably couldn't handle any more lessons. So it was time to go into heaven and, and join all of these souls. So I remember turning and it was like, I was starting to run into heaven and I got frozen in time. And again, God showed his sense of humor and he laughed and he says, oh, no, 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 child. You're not staying. <laughs> your mission has just begun. You work for me now, remember? And he said, before I send you back, I want to give you two more gifts. I want to give you the gift of knowledge and the gift of wisdom. And as soon as he said that, I felt like my head unzipped and opened. And it was like this Rolodex. And I was being just flooded with tremendous amount of knowledge I can't even recall. I mean, I can't access even close to it, but was put in here. But at the time, not only was all the knowledge coming in, but God was explaining everything, all of the answers to everything you can imagine and the wisdom. And then he zipped me back up and he said, now you're going to take patience and beauty and knowledge and wisdom. And when you go back, you're going to be quiet and listen to the people that I put into your life. And then when you speak, you will change millions of people's lives. And before I could even utter the words to argue with God, my case to try to stay, I felt like I was being shoved into this tunnel. And this time, this tunnel was completely the opposite of the tunnel that I told you guys that I went to heaven in. This tunnel was all black. There was no light. It was incredibly confining. So I felt like I was standing with my hands to my side and there was no room. In this tunnel, as I'm going down, I knew where I was going because God just told me he was sending me back to earth. 
but I have this feeling, oh my God, um, earth is in flames. I don't really know how this is going to go down or what I'm even supposed to be doing. So I had a lot of panic moments and I didn't feel what I had felt up until this moment the whole time, which was this love connection to God. I, I felt alone. I couldn't feel this connection all of a sudden God. And it was terrifying. I did not have access to any of my human senses, the sight, you know, the smell, the, the touch, feel. I was like completely, it was terrifying. And I also felt like, wow, you know, going up to heaven, it was exhilarating. It was supersonic. But going back down, it was like, I felt like it was so cumbersome and slow. And at one point, <clears throat> I stopped in the tunnel. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. I'm stuck. It was terrifying because I didn't know why I was stuck. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't feel anything. And I'm panicking. And all of a sudden, I could hear something, but it was really faint. And it sounded like almost like um, a buzzing noise. And so I'm like, okay, well, here's the deal. I know I'm supposed to go back down and finish this. Now I work for God mission. And the sooner I do that, I can go to heaven and be at my real home. So I got to figure something out. So I've got to go with what I have. And that was this noise. So I'm trying to pay attention to what this was to see if it could help me get started in the tunnel again. And the more I'm paying attention to this noise, the louder it got. And then it started sounding like um, when I was young, um, the TV, like if you left it on till midnight, then the American flag would go on and then, and then it would go off the screen. It would be like this buzzing staticky noise. And it, that's what that noise reminded me of, this like really loud shh, buzzing static. So I'm paying attention to this noise. And as I'm paying attention to this noise, the sound starts pulling me through the tunnel. So I'm going out of the tunnel now, and now I'm completely laying on my back and I still can't move. My hands are stuck to my side. I don't know where I'm going. All I know is I'm listening to this noise because it's all I have to go off of and it's taking me somewhere. And it finally takes me and it kind of stops and I'm hovering and I don't know where I am but I'm listening to the noise. And now the noise goes from this buzzing, staticky, loud noise to like all this muffled garbling noise. And I'm like, oh my God, why does that sound like a bunch of people talking and I can't understand what they're saying? That's what it sounded like to me. And as soon as I had that realization, I could understand everybody perfectly. All of these people, there was massive amounts of people we're all talking at once, having conversations, talking different languages. Mind you, I never knew a foreign language ever, but I could understand every single person's talking at once. And as soon as I have this realization, oh my God, I can understand all these people. It was like a huge, like if you were in an auditorium and everybody's talking at once and you're trying to listen because it, you know, you're trying to have a conversation, but you can't hear because there's so many people talking. It's just very overwhelming. That's the sense I got. And I start noticing, oh, it must be one o'clock, my alarm. Okay, I'm gonna try to wrap it up. So there's so much that happened. But anyway, we gotta stay on schedule. Okay, so quickly. Um, I get the realization that people are having conversations and talking and I need to listen for help because I don't know where I'm at. And so I'm listening intently and I realize, oh my God, this is all negative. There's self-loathing, there's anger, there's hate, there's people that are tearing each other down. There's so much judgment. What is going on? As soon as I have that realization, I realized, oh my God, I'm on the edge of hell. There was no doubt in my mind where I was, and I was terrified. As soon as I had that realization, I knew exactly where I was. My body lit up. Remember, God says, we are the rock. We are the light. My light came on as soon as I had that realization. And as soon as I, my light came on, I was able to see that I was just covering just inches above all of these people below me at the edge of hell, and they could see me because my light was on. And as soon as I had the realization that they could see me, I felt all of these hands to the fingers, everything I could feel them pulling me down to them. They wanted the light. They wanted this life force. They were desperate. And I was terrified because 
each with each hand and finger on me, I felt them pulling me down more into where they were. And my life force was being drained out of me. And I knew in that moment that if I was to stay there any longer, my life force would be so depleted, I would not be able to ever get out. And I did not want to be there. I was terrified. I wanted to be with God. I had just had this connection with God, this incredible connection. And I, all I could do was cry out. And I cried out to God, I love you, God, please help me. And all I did was cried out. And I established that connection again, that desire by me doing that, established that love connection. And as soon as that happened, all of the hands instantly had to let go of me. And I started rising up high enough that none of them could touch me. And as soon as I rose up high enough, I'm still on my back with my hands to my side. I remember now floating out of that space and I could feel that I was going back to the tunnel that I had been in. And as I'm leaving this place, I'm talking to God now this whole time again. And I'm telling him, God, thank you so much. I love you so much. Oh my gosh. I, and then all of a sudden I stop myself and I have this realization. Oh my God, wait, wait, wait. Those people, they're left behind. God, don't forget the people. I could feel that despite all of the self-loathing, the anger, the, the, the negative things, I could feel through them that they were God's children. There was hope. And I remember saying to God, no, wait, bring them, bring them with me. Can't they come with me? And God told me again, Erica, with the gift of life, hand in hand, I give you free will. And so I had to leave those people behind. My body kept floating. I finally got into the tunnel. I was stood upright again. My hands were still stuck to my side. The tunnel was still completely dark and confining, but now it started going again. And I started going back down to earth. I was completely exhausted. And it was very tiring to try to even keep this uh, connection with God going, but I knew that it was the life force that I needed to be able to get down to earth. It was love. Love was the answer. And so I proceeded to talk to God the whole way down. It felt like it took a really long time. And finally, I got to you know the end of that tunnel and I was put on the ceiling. Now, this ceiling was in the emergency room of the hospital. And I remember looking down at my body, which was that lifeless shell, but it was on a gurney now. And I remember knowing that I was going to have to go back into that body because God just told me I'm on a mission. I work for him. Well, how am I going to get that done? You got to be in your vehicle. Your vehicle is your human shell, your physical body. And I looked at it and I I said, there is no possible way that I am going to go back into there. Because first of all, I can't fit. I mean, I am this vast, cool, love being. I cannot fit in that confining shell. And I remember trying to fight it. I, I was panicking. I didn't think I could do it. But yet at the same time, I knew that here's God giving me this chance. And I knew it was important. And I remember one moment before I was forced to go back in, there was three little elderly nurses that came to me and they sat me down and they said, and listen, you are going to go back into the body. Yes, it's going to hurt, but you have a job to do and God is with you and God loves you. And in that moment, again, couldn't argue. I just remember being stuffed back into my body and trying to unfold myself into this shell and feeling like, yeah, I can't even unfold my whole self. I've got to make it fit somehow, but it was very cumbersome. It was painful and it hurt. And I remember breathing and I remember waking up and my husband was crying over my body. And I remember it was so important to me to not forget everything that just happened because I knew it wasn't just about what I learned, but it was how to help so many people, all of us. And that I didn't know how I was going to remember everything. I just felt so responsible. And I thought, okay, I've got to tell Derek, that's my husband. And I remember trying to speak the words to start telling him what, where I had just been and what I had just learned. And I couldn't talk. I had no voice. And the doctor came in the room at that moment. And he said, Ms. McKenzie, you, you know, you've been through a lot. It's okay. Shh, it's okay. Don't talk. You need to rest. And so they checked me into the hospital and my husband had gone home, you know, to be with the kids. And I was supposed to rest that night. 
Um, and the next morning that I came in, um, and I'll just leave you with this, and then we'll go to the questions. I'll just leave you this because it's important. Uh, the doctor, the attending physician came in, and my husband wasn't back yet. It was just myself. And he had left the door open. And in the hallway, the nurse was charting right outside my door so she could hear the whole conversation. And the doctor came in, and he said, good morning, Mrs. McKenzie. How are you feeling today? You've been through a lot. And all of a sudden, I thought I was going to throw up. And I reached for that pink little bedpan. And I was like, but it was my voice. And I said, oh, my God. Oh my God, doctor, doctor, I have to tell you, okay, I've just been to heaven. I've been with God. And this is what God said to me. And I started to try to tell him because I didn't want to forget. And he just looked at me and it was like all of the color just started draining from his face. It was completely white. He didn't even do my health assessment. He didn't stand and listen to what I was trying to tell him. He didn't acknowledge me. He just turned around and he left. And the nurse came in that was charting on me in the hallway. And she sat down on the side of the bed and I was devastated. I was crying. I couldn't believe this. It was very overwhelming for me. And the nurse said to me, go ahead and listen, child. How many times have I heard that, right? I can tell you guys, it's so important for each of us not to forget this. Be quiet and listen. You have a profound story that you need to share with many. But right now, this is not the place to tell that story. You see, I've worked for that doctor for seven years, and I'm so sorry, child, that the first person that you tried to tell this beautiful experience to to help others is an atheist. But you're going to have to learn when to speak and when not. And so what proceeded to happen is a few hours later, my husband came back in the room with that doctor. and. You know, my husband loved me more than anything. He wanted the best for me. And I believe in my heart that that doctor wanted the best intentions for me, but, you know, let his personal beliefs and his bias get in the way of doing the best plan of care for the patient. And so he thought I was crazy. And he said, now, Miss McKenzie, even though you don't have any history of um, any mental disorders or anything like that, you know, you are a little old for the onset of bipolar disorder. You're 31. Um, I'm pretty sure this is what's happened. And, you know, you've come to this breaking point, but we're going to help you. We're going to, you know, check you in to a psychiatric facility. We're going to get you the help you need so you can go home and be with those beautiful babies of yours, you know, because you deserve that. And my husband, you know, we're taught you, you respect your elders, you respect your doctor, the doctor knows. And so he said, yep, you know what? And we're actually going to send you the Mayo Clinic because, you know, my husband wanted the best and they have the best help there. And so I, because of what I shared, um, you know, I was checked in against my will for almost a month away from my children who were little at the time and my family and put on a lot of medications that have a lot of, you know, good qualities for people that really need them. But, but if you're somebody that doesn't need those things, it can be extremely toxic and cause a lot of other problems. So that was a whole nother story of, you know, what I went through, but it was important for me to go through that to, to learn, you know, a lot of lessons. So anyway, that's all we have time for. I think we have some questions. Hey, thank you, Erica. There's just so much there, and yeah. uh, it's fascinating. And I'm sure there's lots and lots of questions. Um, just for everyone to know, we're going to have a, probably just about 10 minutes to ask and answer questions. So it'll be a short time. Type your questions into the chat, and uh, I'll read them. Or you, Erica, and Chick shall answer. Um, so while you're doing that, I'll ask a, a question, which is, um, Following your near death experience, uh, are there any after effects on you? Absolutely. So, this happened to me over 20 years ago, and I'm still learning from my own experience. But I can tell you guys um, that, you know, as a child, one of the gifts that I was given was I was able to get what I call downloads um, from God for people that there's no way I would have that information and efforts to help. And throughout my whole life, those things happened to me so many times that I came to understand that was a gift. But when I came back from this near-death experience, that gift was now 
on steroids. And so there was a big learning curve on how I, I it was almost like a radio. I had, had learned to turn down the volume dial so that I could function as Erica, the mother, the wife, you know, the person, the human being in the, on the earth experience, but then turn it up to be able to help people with these downloads, which they were always in efforts to help. Um, so that was uh, an after effect. Another after effect was that there was these things I didn't know at the time that I started seeing with my eyes, which were called orbs, they're called orbs. And so that's a whole lesson on being able to see those and communicate and um, how they help us here with heavenly messages and those kind of things. So there was a lot of things that I experienced, just also the way that I could see people um, and all the good things and the wonderful things because of what I've been through. You know, so there's definitely a lot of after effects that happen and I'm still, you know, learning 20 plus years later and dealing with the after effects, so. Thank you, Erica. Yeah. Uh, Julianne asks, can you speak to what helped you get away from using antipsychotics and rejecting that label from the doctor oh. and what helps you turn down the volume? Yeah, um, so thank you for those questions. And they are important because what I'm going to tell you as a nurse goes against everything that I learn, you know, as a health professional to tell a patient to do, but I was completely guided with, um, you know, prayer and God was with me the whole time that I was in the psych ward. And I knew that, um, what I had to do to get off those medicines, because I was on as many as eight at one time was when the, they would ask me, um, how are you feeling today, Mrs. McKenzie? You know, did you really go to heaven? Did you really see God? You know, those kind of questions. Well, when I was first admitted, I told the truth. I was raised to tell the truth and it did happen. So what I learned though quickly is that my medications would get, I get more medications added and my levels would go up on my medications. So I had to fight this knowing what I went through, but then denying it so that slowly a lot of the medications got titrated down to more of a level of, you know, me being able to function. And, you know, it was, the side effects were terrible. And so I knew that when I, was able to do that for a long period of time, they would trust that I was being managed correctly and they would let me go. And so when I would go home and leave their care, I was supposed to continue to see a doctor um, and be under their supervision, but I knew that I needed to get off the medications and I trusted God. And I basically, when I did get dismissed and I went home, I started fleshing the medications and I, you know, I still let my family think for about a month that I was on was still on them because I knew it, it needed to be enough time that would go on until I finally sat my husband down the day that he said to me, you know what, you're back. I am so grateful. You're better than ever. See, trust, trust the doctors, trust us. And I said, Derek, you need to sit down because I need to tell you something. I said, I haven't been taking those medications for almost a month. And I didn't tell you because I needed to get to this place that you'd really understand you know, what I went through. And that's when I shared with him for the first time, my near-death experience, everything I had gone through, the diet pills that I'd taken, everything. And him knowing me, I think that really helped. Um, he knew me since I was 18. We've been together for so many years. So he knew me before all of this. He knew the person that I was. And so when I told him all of this, you know, he believed me. But yeah, I had to deny it. And, and I never took those medicines again. Um, that's how I got off of them. You know, I wasn't crazy, so I didn't need them. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of that question? The second was, how do you dial down? Oh, you know, the volume. Um, yeah. Basically, that's, I had, I had a good friend suggest it to me and just said, you know, visualize that it's a radio and you're going to turn the volume down. And you have to practice that because what was happening to me for years and still it will, if I'm not conscious of it, is, um, you know, I'll, I'll go to the grocery store, I'm doing human things, right? And I will start getting downloads to help that person or whatever. And so then what happens is, um, it's almost like I have one foot in the other side and one foot here as a human, and I'm trying to operate, but I can't. And when you keep doing that, it becomes very taxing on your physical body. So I would start getting sick and really run down. And so it was imperative that I learned this balance 
of it was okay to not help everybody. I felt this, this responsibility, for example, if I had a download to help that person. You know? But I had to learn. There was a learning curve that, yes, maybe I had that information, but maybe it wasn't time. Maybe there was another way I could help um, in that. I, because I had to exist. You have to take care of this vehicle. It's the only one we all have. And it's the only way you're going to get your missions done while you're here. And so having that understanding made me have the permission to give myself to really care for myself and know that it's okay to turn that down because I have to keep a balance. So it's really been a, a learning process for me on how to balance everything. Thank you, Erica. Well, we just have time for one more question. Uh, and so that is, uh, as asks, uh, Erica, when you have a difficult time and feel down, what do you say to yourself to remind yourself of this experience to get out of it? Or do the downloads appear as they are needed? Thank you for your story. Yeah, oh my gosh, that's a great question. Um, a lot to it because the downloads always appear when they're needed. Um, I can go for periods of time and not have a download, for example, and then doing a really good job as a human um, and, you know, doing the daily things, the daily living. And then all of a sudden, it's like, I don't even have to think about when the downloads are coming. They just come when they're supposed to. Um, but for me, because I'm in the human body, I am human. So I am exposed to, you know, the judgments of people, the anger, the things we see on the news, that sadness, you know, all these, I'm exposed to all of that. And so it's easy to get caught up in that. And so I, it's funny, I, sometimes I will like put one of my videos on, or I'll get my book out again when I'm praying. And it helps me to not only remember, but kind of like put the pause button on for that moment and go back there. Because I can't be completely there as long as I'm in the shell. And it just helps me be grounded to remember what I learned and how important it is for all of us. It is, and I am human. And so I continue to not only take from what I've learned, but I continue to learn from others every day. And that's why it's important and why I, I love having this opportunity, you know, to have these um, times to share with these organizations. It's so imperative that we all share these different experiences we've had. They're so valuable. They're so valuable. Thank you, Erica. Uh, it's really inspiring and fascinating. And I think you've whet uh, a lot of appetites to learn more because yeah. there's obviously a lot more to your, your experiences and yeah. what you want to share with people. Thank you so much. And uh, Oh, speaking of sharing, Brian, I, yeah. I need to remember, I probably need to put up, I'm just going to really quickly screen share with yeah. you guys, if that's okay. Uh, yes, Yvonne please. was an amazing teacher, by the way, on all this. Can you guys see this? Did I do that correctly? Yes, we can okay. see that. Okay. Yeah, there's my website and my book. And if you go on my website, you can order it and um, it'll fill in a lot of the blanks, like I said, because time is what we use here as humans. And there's just wasn't enough time to share everything, but hopefully the puzzle pieces will be put in. And I love you all. And I just want to say, you know, you're all loved and you are all so valuable please, please, please love yourselves. You are amazing human beings. If I don't get to talk to any of you again, please enjoy the journey. You're very loved. Thank you, Erica. And we'll turn it back to Dr. Kaysan. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. That was an absolutely inspiring yeah. presentation. And um, I'm sure not only did it touch everyone's heart today um, and soul, but uh, lots of people will be watching this video later. And, and I know they're going to be really, really inspired by what you shared today. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. And God bless you. God bless all of you. And God bless you too, Erica. Okay.